Today we're reading Acts chapter 17, verses 1 to 15. Now the chapter opens and Paul and his companions have just arrived at a city called Thessalonica. Similar to in other cities that Paul visited, his first step was to find the local synagogue. And for three Sabbaths, he preaches at the local synagogue, Luke tells us. Um, he tells them all about who Jesus was, how Jesus was the Messiah. From his preaching, Luke writes that the people were convinced and joined Paul and Silas on this mission. However, that wasn't the case for all people. Um, we read in Acts chapter 17, verse 5, But some of the Jews were jealous, so they gathered some troublemakers from the marketplace to form a mob and start a riot. So many of the Jews became extremely jealous of the attention that Paul was getting and the people that were coming to believe in what Paul was preaching. So what do this group of religious leaders do, the Jewish people in the community? Um, they stir up some bad characters in the marketplace and they start a riot in the city. Now, it's interesting to note here that they weren't motivated to do this out of a concern over what Paul and Silas were saying. They were doing this. They were motivated by their jealousy of Paul and Silas over the situation. Um, the NIV Study Bible writes this, Their motives for causing the riot were rooted in personal jealousy, not doctrinal purity. Now let's read on where we left off um, at the second part of verse 5. They attacked the home of Jason, searching for Paul and Silas so they could drag them out to the crowd. Not finding them there, they dragged out Jason and some of the other believers instead and took them before the city council. Paul and Silas have caused trouble all over the world, they shouted, and now they are here disturbing our city too. And Jason has welcomed them into his home. They are all guilty of treason against Caesar, for they profess allegiance to another king named Jesus. The people of the city, as well as the city council, were thrown into turmoil by these reports. So the officials forced Jason and the other believers to post bond, and then they released them. So the group of rioters is taken to the home of a man named Jason. We don't know much about Jason, but we can assume that he was a type of sponsor for Paul and Silas while they were in Thessalonica. He gave them a place to stay during their ministry in the city. And when the group doesn't find Paul and Silas at his home, they take Jason as well as some other believers that they find and bring them before the city council. And they declare all of their concerns over what Paul and Silas over what the believers are saying. And then between the crowd and the city officials, they were all disturbed by what, what they were telling them they were saying, by what they were telling them that Paul and Silas were saying. This caused the city officials to require Jason and the other believers to post bail or put up money as a form of security. And what this meant is that they, um, if more trouble were to take place around Paul and Silas, if more trouble were to come up, um, their personal property would have been at stake and their lives would have also been at stake. And this just caused me to um, ponder the the courage that Jason and the other believers had to show in this time. This is just a small snapshot of what they put on the line for the sake of the ministry of Paul and ultimately the message of the gospel. It makes me wonder not only about Jason and these believers that we see in this chapter, but also um, all of the people that we hear little or nothing about in the Bible, um, people who really did take up the call, especially during this formative time in the church, they did take up the call to follow Jesus and put everything on the line for the sake of the gospel. Who are all these hidden figures that God has used throughout all of time to bring about his plans and purposes on this earth? Um, people that we hear nothing about, but have played instrumental roles where God has planted them. I am just reminded that there is no small calling from God. One day, it would be so cool to see all of the stories that God has master weaved 
a part of his perfect and holy plan here on this earth. But for now, because we don't have access to that information or that knowledge, um, for now, it's our job to simply be faithful to what God has called each of us to do, not what he's asked our friends to do, not what he's asked the person whose life that we are secretly jealous of to do, but what has he called me? What has he called you to do? You never know how God is weaving what he has called you do, you to do as part of his master plan, as part of his giant story that he is weaving throughout all of time, all of history for the sake of redeeming this world, for the sake of bringing his kingdom here to earth. And that, my friends, is something to live all out for here on this earth. So my encouragement to you today is to take account of what God is calling you to do right now, today. It doesn't have to be something big, you know? Like, what is that one small thing that maybe God is calling you to do today? Um, there is no small calling from God. Everything has a purpose according to His plans and His timing. I hope that you have a great rest of your day, and I will see you next time. If these devotional videos are helpful to you, Subscribe to our channel and click the notification button so you know when we post a new video. And of course, please share them with others.